growing up, um, we have heard many words, right? It's how we, if I can get the clicker out of my pocket, oh my goodness. Um, it's how we learn how to speak, really, by, by hearing these words and by our parents kind of helping us, um, kind of sounding out the words a little bit, and then we pick up on that. Uh, words are how we learn. Uh, so the thing about words, though, is that words make us feel things. Would you all agree? Words make us feel things. So if I were to say the word sushi, by looking at some of your faces and your mouths watering, some drool coming down, I would say that that would make you feel a little hungry, right? No? Okay, what about, okay, 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 okay. What about some, um, uh, some fried chick? <laughs> oh, yeah, now I have, yeah? Or, or, or those prime steak veggie patties or, or a boca burger. Oh, now I'm talking the right language, right? See, these words make you feel things, right? Uh, or or how, about, um, how about the word, what if I say the word moist? Yeah, some of you got the icks, right? Some of you got, when I said that word, you all just like, oh. My friend, uh, she, she hates the word, that word so much. I mean, like, she really does not like it at all. So as a good, the good friend that I am, I use that word in every single one of my sentences. It's a little moist outside. Or, or maybe I need a little a moist towelette to wash my hands. Or you just see her kind of squirm a little bit because it just gives her the ick of how that word sounds moist. Or how about oozing? These words make you feel things, right? They make you feel things. But what about the L word? What is the L word? And some of you might know kind of where I'm going uh, with this. Do you remember when you heard the first time the L word? Do you remember where you were or what you were doing? Maybe it was from a family, uh, your, your parents, your sibling, a friend. But do you remember what... what what, the, when you, what you felt when you heard the L word. Now, kids, close your eyes, I'm about, or close your ears, excuse me. Shut your ears, I'm about to use the L word. Uh, you know, what if, have you ever remembered where you were when you heard the word love? Oh, yeah. Love. I remember when um, I heard the word love, and I'm not talking about my, my, my parents or my sibling uh, or my friends. Oh, no, I'm talking about that significant other, huh? Oh, yeah. I love you. Ooh. Makes you feel all warm and gushy, right? My cheeks turned red. Well, I assume they did because my complexion won't let you show, see the redness in my cheeks. But these words, they make you feel things love. But love is such an interesting and powerful thing. But it's interesting because nowadays we use the word love left and right, right? Oh, I love this. I love that. Oh, I love my car. I love my house. Um, I, I love the bike that I ride every day. I, I love to do, go and do this. We just use it as an everyday word that we have lost the meaning of what love really is. It no longer has the power that it once, once had. But it's interesting because love nowadays is sometimes just an empty word. Because love is not just something you say. Love is something that you do. If you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is where we're going to begin this morning. And this verse kind of sets the tone for what we're going to be discussing today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I am reading from the New American Standard uh, Bible this morning, uh, so it might be a little bit of a different wording there just to let you all know, but love, we get this idea of what love is, and, and in Scripture we get a true identity of what love is. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, and this is what it says, but now faith, hope, love 
abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, these are all great qualities to have or, or to show. When it's realized that all of the qualities of character, love is the one that inspiration uses to describe the very character of God. So love is not just a word, it's a descriptive word. It is describing the very character of, of God. It is easy to see then why the apostle here should say that above all the gifts of the Spirit, because there are many gifts of the Spirit, love is the greatest of them all. As a matter of life, love is more effective, more victorious, and more satisfying. So out of all of these things, out of all of these characteristics, love is the greatest of them all. But let's get into the reason why love is the greatest of them all. If you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 13, excuse me, not 3, chapter 13, verse 10, we get this idea of why love is the greatest, and it begins this talk on why love is is the greatest. Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. He who loves his fellow men has carried out the intent and purpose of the law. All the commandments of God are based upon the principle of love. Did we catch that? All the commandments of God are on the basis of of love, therefore, uh, therefore, his law cannot be perfectly obeyed by mere outward conformity to the letter of the law. Now, let, let's get something straight. We need to remember something: laws, rules, the policies. Insert other synonyms that you may think of. They're there for a reason. They're there for a purpose. These rules, these laws, these policies are set in place to help guide us to direct us in the way that we should go. They are not there to hinder our life, but to enhance our life. So when we are following the rules or the laws or these policies, we're not trying to put a stop to anything. If anything, we're trying to enhance what we are doing. It is the same thing about the laws of God. The laws of God are on this basis of love, so the laws of God do not hinder our lives but enhance our lives. That is why they are there. And that's why in John chapter 14, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus says it very plainly. If you love me, keep my commandments. Again, seeing his commandments are based off of love. But what are his commandments? Where do we find these commandments? Turn with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. This begins that conversation of these commandments of God. Uh, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, remember, this is one of those times when uh, the Jewish leaders are trying to question Jesus to, to capture him, to catch him in a lie or, in a, or saying something blasphemous so they can go against him. So this is one of those stories here. Uh, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So on these two commandments, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor, hangs all of the whole law of God. Now where do we find the law of God? In Exodus. The Ten Commandments. Now, the first four commandments have to deal with what? Have to deal with our relationship with with God. The last six commandments have to do with what? Our relationship with whom? With each other. So, by loving God, we're keeping His commandments, and by loving our neighbor, we're keeping our commandments. So, so it's almost as if this is kind of structured in a certain way. You can't love your neighbor 
without loving God. You need to love God first, and then when you love God first, what follows? Loving your neighbor. Man's natural tendency is to make self first. Our first thought is, how does this benefit me? If I'm going to help my neighbor, if I'm going to love my neighbor, what do I get out of it? Right? That's what we have come to in this day. Dare I say, that's what our church has come to. Ooh, pastor, you're getting real now. Oh, yes, I am. This world in general, we have gotten to the point where it's not about loving our neighbor, it's about loving ourselves first. We become self-absorbed and we don't think about anyone but ourselves. It does not matter if you look out of the church or in the church, you're going to find people who don't care about anyone else but themselves. That is the reality that we are in. To be completely selfless is dealing with his fellows as a man first love is with God supremely. Again, it's like God had an idea here. It's like God was on to something. Hey, love me first, and then when you love me, you're going to be able to love your neighbor. This is why God tells us to love him first. But God, but pastor, excuse me, I do love God. But you know, it's just I have, I have troubles loving this one person because they're against me. Then brother, sister, do you truly love God? How could you say that to me, pastor? Of course I love God, but you just said you can't love your neighbor. Then that just means you don't love God. Because if you truly love God, you can love your neighbor. Okay, pastor, well, what about those who are persecuting me? What about those who are planning something against me? How am I supposed to love them? Well, doesn't Scripture say, love your enemies? Pray for those who persecute you? You're telling me you want me to pray for those who are planning a plot against me? Yes. Yes, because if you love God, you're able to love your enemies. If you love God first, everything else is going to follow suit. You won't have an issue loving your neighbor. But what is, what is love? Because again, we, we talk about love. Oh, I love this, I love that. What is the definition of love? And maybe we need to define what love actually is. You see, there are different types of love, and Scripture tells us these different types of love. Uh, Philian is a general descript- that describes affectionate sentiment love, sentimental love, excuse me, based on the emotions and feelings. So this type of love is more of a parent and a child type of love. That is what that love is. In the New Testament, agapin is describes a love from the standpoint of respect and esteem. Thus, the agape of the New Testament is love in its highest and truest form of love. It implies reverence for God and respect for one fellow men. So when we're saying to love your neighbor, I am not telling you you need to go to every single person in this church and start saying, hey, I love you. I mean, if you do, great. We need more love. (laughs) But that's not what Scripture is necessarily telling us. By saying we are loving our neighbor, we are saying respect each other. Honor each other. Ah, so love takes a whole different turn a little bit. When you love God, you're given the strength to love your neighbor, which means you're honoring that person. You are respecting that person. To agape in our bitterness enemies is to treat them with respect and courtesy and to regard them as God regards them. That is what we are talking about, church. When we are saying love your neighbor, all scripture is telling us is to respect each other. That is all we are saying. 1 John 4 tells us, Beloved, let us love one another for the love is from God And everyone who loves is born of God 
and knows God. Let us love one another. Prayer for the one whom we do not love will bring the love of God into our hearts and will arouse an interest in our brother's welfare. Again, if we love God first, if we are made right with God, if we have that constant communication with God, we are then given that strength that we need to then love and pray for our fellow neighbor. Now, when I say neighbor, I'm not talking about the person who lives next door to you or across from you or maybe the house behind you. When I'm talking about neighbor, I want you to look to your left. I want you to look to the right, to look in front of you, to look behind you, to look within these walls. We are all neighbors. When you're, in the, when you're at Walmart, Safeway, City Market, the person you pass by in the vegetable aisle, that is your neighbor. The neighbor is expanded to include all of humanity. So when God is saying love your neighbor, he's not just saying to love those who are close to you, but he is saying to love everyone, respect each other. That is what God is telling us to do. For love is from God. Now I love this, I love this part, this phrase uh, in the Greek, because when you're in the Greek, you get a little bit more in depth. Uh, the original languages are, are a beautiful thing to understand and to read. And in the English language, we sometimes kind of take that meaning away. So while here it says, for love is from God, it's a powerful phrase. But when you look in the Greek, in the Greek, it's a literal, love is coming out of God. Meaning, it originated in Him. Love is not just something God gives. It's something that is pouring out of him. It is coming out. It is oozing out of him. That is where this purest form of love comes, and we are given that love. So if we are given that love, why can we not give it out? Why are we holding it to ourselves? But again, this is why it's so important that when we love our neighbor, we have to make sure that we love God first. If there is an issue with you and God, I'm sorry to say that you're going to have an issue loving your neighbor. You've got to fix whatever's wrong between you and God first. Because when you love the Lord your God, you will love your neighbor. That will follow suit. Loving God means loving our neighbor. But, but why do we love God? Why do we love our neighbor? And if, if we can be honest with each other, we can't love on our own. That is not something that we are capable of doing alone. First John 4.19, as it was read this morning, we love because he first loved us. If God had not first loved us, we would not be capable of love. We would have been abandoned in sin and would have produced hate instead of affection. Because God loved us first is the reason we love first. Now you see, this is kind of... This is kind of on the line of, of forgiveness. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about forgiveness. And we read the verse, we are forgiven. Why? Because he forgave. Because he forgave first. That's why we are forgiven. It's the same concept here. Why do we love? Because he loved us first. Again, everything has to come from God first before we can go out and do it. Because if we are going out doing something without God, let me tell you that's not going to bring much fruit. You have to have God. You have to have that love of God first before you go out and love your neighbor. Or, or maybe let's change the wording a little bit. Respect your neighbor. Because chances are, the chances are 100% here, we all think differently. The way I do something is not the way somebody else is going to do something. The way I stand up here to preach the word of God and I'm going to pick on you, Pastor, Pastor Austin here, is not the way Pastor, um, 
Austin is going to preach the Word of God. We all do things differently. We all think differently. We all do different things. However, we were given the same mission, and that is to bring people before the throne of grace. Now let me ask a question. If that is our mission, if our mission is to bring people before the cross of God, how can we do that when people walk through our doors and they see hatred and they see division and they see us arguing with each other and disrespecting each other? How can we do that? How can we accomplish our mission? Because let's think, let's ask ourselves, how many people walk through our doors and not just our doors here in Grand Junction, our doors as a, as a universal church, as an Adventist world church, how many people walk through that door and are feeling loved? How many are feeling welcomed? Or how many are being turned away because of the way they are dressed, because of the way they look? or because they see us arguing and disrespecting each other, going against everything that God has told us to do. That cannot happen. When people walk through our doors, they need to be seeing love. They need to be seeing respect going through these walls. They need to see us have a disagreement, and then they're going to be surprised and being like, whoa, they just had a disagreement but look at them. Look how they're laughing together. Look how they are respecting each other. Because, church, let me tell you something. When people see us, they shouldn't be seeing us. They should be seeing God through us. And when we are hating each other, disrespecting each other, they are not seeing God. They are seeing a whole different side of a battle that we're in. So my question is, why are we not loving each other? Why are we not respecting each other? What are we doing as a church? Why are we in this together? We're in this walk of life together, yet we're trying to tear each other down. We are not loving our neighbors. We are not respecting each other. That's important why we need to have that communication with God. It all starts with God. When you love God, you will be able to love your neighbor. And why? We love because He, the God of this universe, the creator of everything, loved us first. So church family, my question to you this morning is, will you love each other? We thank you for loving us first, something we do not deserve, but you so graciously loved us that you sent your son to die for us. What greater love than a parent giving their child so everyone can be saved? We thank you for that love. We pray for that strength to in return love our neighbor. Why? Because truly you loved us first. We just thank you so much for being that loving God. And as we leave today, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone.